Uh, if you have a copy of God's Word, join me in John chapter 7. As you're turning in your Bibles to John 7, I want to ask a question for us to think about today. And uh, we'll guide a little bit, or at least be thought-provoking as we enter into our conversation today around the last part of John 7 is, have you ever gotten caught breaking a rule? You don't have to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask that for this today. <laughs> I might ask that some Sundays, but not this one. Have you ever gotten caught maybe breaking a law or doing something you weren't supposed to? What, what is the worst part of getting caught? It's the consequences, right? Getting caught, I mean, the consequences, because you, you, you know it's, it's going to be bad, right? I mean, when you're a kid and your parent had a rule and you broke that, you knew there was going to be a consequence to pay. Maybe uh, time missed doing something fun or maybe groundation or maybe um, corporal punishment or, or something. You, you knew something was coming as an adult. You break the law. You know there's a consequence coming. And I'll talk about that in just a minute for me. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that no matter what we've done, if we place faith in your son Jesus, that we don't have to walk under the weight of our consequences. Maybe some here on this life. But we don't have to be eternally separated from you. We thank you for the grace that's found in your Son. And Father, as we begin to unearth some of the consequences we face for rejecting your Son, Jesus, I pray that, number one, our eyes would be open to whether we place our faith in your Son, but also I pray that our eyes would be open to our neighbors and those around us that don't know about your Son, Jesus, or maybe have rejected him. Well, I pray you give us a heart today for what breaks your heart. You would give us a passion for what you're passionate about. I pray that you move in our heart and life in a way that only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So back to that question about breaking rules or breaking the law. So Julie and I were newlyweds, and we were serving at a church. I was serving as youth pastor of a church in Middle Tennessee, and we were serving there together. And Julie was also teaching at a Christian school uh, just down the road. And I would often go. She was head of the, the, uh, the cheerleaders, right? You did that. She was the cheer coach. And so I would go to the ball games, and we would watch the ball games and, and the cheer routine and all that stuff. And then, then we would follow, she would follow me back home about, you know, about a 30-minute drive. And one particular night, she had a student in that car with her. And so they were following me home, and, and it was a dark road. It was near Natchez Trace Parkway in Middle Tennessee. It was, there was no one on the road, and it was flat, and it was straight. Do you get where I'm fixing to go with this? And I was just moving along. And I was driving, and I was cruising. I wasn't paying attention. I, I had all six cylinders in full gear, and I was just going down the road, and I was going home. I was a good bit ahead of Julie. And everything was going fine. I get to the Natchez Trace Parkway there on Highway uh, 412, and everything seemed to be fine and seemed to be great. And then all of a sudden, I have blue lights that encounter me. And I'm like, why did he turn those blue lights on? And then I look down, and I know why he turned the blue lights on. I was speeding. And so I just went ahead and pulled over. And the officer got out and began to go the process of giving my speeding ch ticket and all that stuff. But you know the worst part of that was? Watching Julie drive by with that teenage girl in our youth group. <laughs> and that teenage girl's mama was the office manager at the church where I served. <laughs> so the next day in the office, I got, well, here we were going a little fast last night. <laughs> I hope you don't drive that way with kids in the van. There, there's just something about the consequences, right? There's just something that when we get caught breaking the rule, that there's a consequences, and there's consequences that we have to, to pay the price of, and sometimes we don't get caught, and we don't have to pay the consequences, but we've all had moments where we've gotten caught. Maybe it was lying to a parent, and you got caught. Maybe it was cheating on a test, and, and you got caught. Maybe it was like myself, you were speeding, and you got caught caught. 
Often it's not until we are faced with the consequences that we see the true error of our decision. In John chapter 7, hatred for Jesus, we learned last week, is ratcheting up. This is the events that John's giving us. John does not give the gospel in sequential order. In chronology, he's giving us just kind of things based on importance on what he was trying to share about Jesus. And so hatred for Jesus is ratcheting up in John 7. It's the last year of the life of Jesus. Things are, are, are getting worse between Jesus and the Jewish religious leadership. And things are tense. There's a lot more questions about Jesus. There's questions we move into the last part of John 7 about Jesus' identity. Who is he? Is he the Messiah? Is he not the Messiah? Is he a prophet? Is he a teacher? What is he? Who is he? And so there's all of these questions swirling around in the background. In the midst of all this, in the last part of John 7, in three powerful statements, Jesus points out the problem these people had. And the problem they had is they were rejecting him. It wasn't that Jesus wasn't sufficient. It wasn't that Jesus wasn't the Son of God. The problem the Jewish leaders had, the problem many in the crowds had, is they had rejected who Jesus was. They had rejected him as Messiah and Lord of their life. And then Jesus goes on in the rest of John 7, and he tells them, it, in facing their rejection, he tells them that there's consequences to be paid. So today we're going to answer a simple question. What are the consequences of rejecting Jesus. Jesus shares with us three things and statements he makes throughout the last part of this chapter. We're going to zero in on them, but we are going to go verse through verse through this. So I want us just to pick up in verse 25 of John 7 as we see the situation as it is. Remember, Jesus had been teaching in the temple at this point. There were a crowds a gathering, questions being had, and the Jewish leadership looking to kill him, looking to imprison him. And so here's what happens in John 7 verse 25. Some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? I mean, word was out on the street. There was no secret that the Jewish leadership wanted Jesus dead. And so the crowds knew it. The people knew it. The people in the temple hearing Jesus teach knew it. And they're like, well, if they're trying to kill him, why is he still there? Verse 26 goes on. Yet, look, he's speaking publicly and they're saying nothing to him. So another question comes up and they go, can it be true that the authorities know he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. And when the Messiah comes, nobody will know where he is from. The very first thing, very first consequence we see Jesus address in just a moment is this consequence. If you reject Jesus, you will never truly, really know God. You may know a lot about him. You may know some facts about him. You may know some statistics about him. You may know what the biblical record records about him, but you will not personally, really, truly know him. To reject Jesus means you're never going to know God, and that's where these people were. I mean, they knew, they thought they knew where he was from, and they thought that they didn't know where the Messiah was going to come from, and so they were having a hard time reconciling these things. They knew a lot of facts about Jesus, but they didn't really know God. They didn't really even know Jesus. The people are confused. They want to know why these religious leaders aren't putting Jesus in prison. They're, they have these idea about who he is. They just aren't really sure about who he is. They want to know do these religious leaders know something about Jesus that they don't because they're confused. They don't understand. They, they thought they knew something that they didn't know. Anybody ever been driving down the road and all of a sudden you see all of the large trucks getting over on one side? You ever seen that happen? You're like, well, there must be something going on because they know something we don't. Well, they've got these radios, you know, they're talking to each other and, you know, rah, rah, rah. And, and uh, Breaker Breaker 1-9, whatever they do. And, and they're, they're trying to figure out how, they, they know what's going on ahead. And so they start getting over. Well, these people think the Jewish leaders, based on how they're treating Jesus, they wanted to kill him, but they're not imprisoning him yet. They're, they're confused. They think there, there must be something going on. And their confusion is based on what they know about Jesus. Is they, they know his hometown, and they didn't think they would ever know the Messiah's hometown. See, they had a lot of facts about Jesus, but they didn't really know him. And here's where this hits you and me. You can know a lot of facts about Jesus. 
not knowing. You can know all the story of the biblical record. You can know all the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus. You can have them memorized. You can have them wrote. You can know them completely. Guess what? The Jewish leaders, they knew it all. They had large sections sections of the Torah memorized. They knew the writings of the the prophets. They knew all the things foretold about the Messiah, but they did not know Jesus. They knew all about this coming Messiah, but they didn't know him. When I was a kid, I would collect baseball and basketball cards. I used to get those basketball cards. I'd put them in this little binder, little sleeve, and I would keep up with them, and I'd walk back and forth, and I'd take the cards out and look at them from time to time, the real valuable ones I wouldn't touch. But, but I, some of the cards I would look, and I would look at the stats, and I got to where I could quote the stats, and I knew information about particular uh, players and Ken Griffey Jr. And, and other players like that, Jose Canseco, and you're like, who are those people? I'm just showing my age. And I, and I knew all these facts, and I knew about these folks, that, but I had never met any of these players. I only had one player that I'd ever met whose card I had. It was Bo Jackson. I met him when he played for the Memphis Chicks, when he played in uh, the minor league for a little bit. But I didn't know them. You know, that's my story as well when it comes to God. I grew up as a child. I grew up in church. My mother had me in church when I was a very young child, just a few weeks old. And, and I would spend most of my years in Sunday school and vacation Bible school and, and doing all those things. And I came down forward when some of my friends responded after vacation Bible school. And I, 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 wanted to, I didn't want to die and go to hell. And so I, I'm going to do what they're doing. And I came down and I shook the pastor's hand. And, and he said, Aaron, why are you here? And he said, I invited Jesus in my heart, but I didn't. My pastor took me at my word and took me in the baptistry. I went in the baptistry, lost. Came out of the baptistry, lost. Why? Because the water has no power. The power is in the blood. The power is in repentance and faith, placing faith in Jesus Christ. It's his work being done in and through us. And so I was was just just over. I, 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 I didn't know him, though. I had gone through the motions. I had knew all the facts, but I didn't know him. Knowing God involves much more than knowing some facts about him. It requires a relationship. And we can see here that these people did not have a relationship with Jesus. They didn't have a relationship with God. They, they didn't know him. They just knew about the Messiah. They knew about Jesus. And they weren't able to reconcile these two things together. And that's where we find ourselves quite often. We know a lot about Jesus. But it might be that we don't because we never place faith in him. We really don't know God. Jesus, in these following verses, makes this very clear, and here's what he says. After seeing the people's response, this back and forth, their questions and and their misunderstandings and their lack of information, they're thinking they know all about Jesus when they really didn't fully know him, Jesus says this. As he was teaching, verse 28, in the temple, Jesus cried out, You know me, and you know where I am from. So he's like, you you know, you know where I'm from, you know I'm from. I come from uh, the town that I come from, and, I, and I've, I've been where I've been, and I'm working here in Galilee. He, he, you know that. But, but he goes on, you know me, and you know where I'm from, yet I have not come on my own, but the one who sent me is true. And then here's what he goes on. This is, these words are, are telling. You don't know him. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. That is a bold statement for Jesus to make. I mean, these guys knew the Old Testament scriptures. These guys knew the Torah front and back. Large sections of it memorized. They had read the writings. They had read the prophets. They, they knew the Old Testament. They, they knew all this stuff. They were making a, Jesus was making a bold statement. We've had a lot of road construction in the area. I mean, it seems if it, all of us have an opinion about that road construction, right? I have opinions about that road construction. I mean, I would think they could do it a little faster, right? I mean, like, you know, not like as if they're not changing miles of road and, and, and doing something. But I have opinions about it, but do you, you know what my problem is? I've never designed or built roads. I am not qualified to make an assessment. So why was Jesus able to make this assessment? He made this assessment, he even says, as one who has been sent from the Father. That Jesus, as the Son of God, makes this assessment looking into their heart and says, you don't know him. You know all about him. 
You know all kinds of facts about him. You know all kinds of things about him. But you don't know him. How did Jesus, how could Jesus make such a claim? Because they didn't believe in him. See, to believe in, in, in God's son, that's the key to knowing the father. To place your faith in the son is the gateway, the key, the door. Jesus uses those very words, gate and door. He's saying that that's the pathway Jesus goes on. And later in John 14, 6, and says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus was telling them something powerful. He was saying that if you want to know the Father, you've got to have a relationship with the Son. And the reason that these folks didn't know the Father is they had no relationship with the Son, because they were trying to substitute knowing about the facts of the situation for knowing the one who is all and in all and through all, the Lord of all creation. They, they, they thought that they just knew the right facts. They thought if they just knew the right things, they substituted that for true belief. There's a place that I, I want to go. I have a goal of going uh, sometime in my early 50s. I'm in my mid to latter 40s and I want to go in the next five or six years I want to go to the Holy Land I've never been there I've spent my entire adult life talking about things that happen in that place talking about Jerusalem and the streets of Jerusalem talking about the Negev talking about the beautiful terrain and having seen pictures of it but I've never been there myself see a lot of us talk about a lot about Jesus but we don't know him personally and the consequence of not believing in God's Son is to never truly, really know God, never have a relationship with Him. And so I have a question before we move on. It's this. Have you placed your faith in Jesus? Do you, do you know God personally? Do you know Him as the Lord and Master of your life? To reject Him is to face the consequence for all of eternity to never know God Thought number two, consequence number two. Not only will we never know God, but if we reject Jesus, we'll never see heaven. As the, as the encounter goes on about in verse 30, verse 30 down to about verse 32, here's what we see. Then they tried to seize him. After Jesus makes this statement, you don't know him, and, and he's from him, and he sent the Father sent him. I mean, this is starting to upset the Jewish leaders, so they tried to seize him. Yet no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. However, many from the crowd believed in him and said, when the Messiah comes, we won't perform, he won't perform more signs than this man has done, will he? The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things about him. And so the chief priests and Pharisees sent servants to arrest him. After this bold statement Jesus makes, then they get upset. The Jewish leaders get on, on point. Then they begin to go about the, the process of trying to imprison him, but they're unsuccessful. Why? Because it's not his time. Jesus has had an appointed time by the Father for him to give up his life. And it wasn't then. He had an appointed moment. He had an appointed time. And so in the midst of all this conflict with the Jews, their people are, are, are also believing. Look what we see here in verse, I believe it was verse uh, Verse 31. However, many from the crowd believed in him. And they said, I'm summarizing. If, if this, the Messiah is not going to do more than this guy. And so they, they believe. They, they, they place faith in some measure and, and some level in Jesus. They acknowledge there's something about him and they believe in him. Even when all these folks are rejecting Jesus, Jesus is still changing lives. How many of you like to watch the news? You raise your hand. It's not a whole lot of people in the room. So I'm like, I just watch for the weather and then cut it off. Uh, that's about the extent of which I would watch it. I, I don't really like to watch the news. Why? There's just a lot of bad stuff on there, right? A lot of fighting and politics and craziness happening in our world. I mean, there's a lot of things. I mean, and, and if you like to watch news, that's good. You just tell me when something bad's about to happen. And get my digits and text me. Let me know. Uh, if something bad happens, just text me. Let me know what's going on. Uh, but I, I don't really watch the news. because There's just so much bad out there. So much negative out there. 
It's easy when we, when we get caught up with all the negative information happening in the world. It's easy to think everything bad, only bad things are the things that are happening. All that was happening in that moment, all the hatred, all the questions, all the attempts to imprison Jesus, all the attempts to take his life, all these attempts, and Jesus is still changing lives. In the midst of all this, people are still believing in Jesus with all of the negativity, all the naysaying, all the stuff. And as believers, it's easy for us to become discouraged about what we see in the world. But there's still hope. Jesus is still changing lives. I love how Devin prayed just a moment ago. He prayed, God, we thank you for what you have done. God, we thank you for what you are doing. And God, we thank you for what you are yet to do. We need to believe that he truly is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, that he has the first word and the final word on this. And we need to trust him. And here we see in the midst of a difficult moment, people placing faith in Jesus, people trusting him. But yet these Jews were struggling to believe. Why? Because Jesus threatened their control. He threatened their power. He threatened their control. He was threatening them because he was liberating the people from their laws and rules and rituals to following him and having a true relationship with the Father. The reason many people reject Jesus and miss heaven is because they refuse to give up control. We want to live our little controlled lives in our controlled environments. And we want to control the outcome. But salvation is only found in surrendering and giving Jesus control of your life. And saying, this is not mine, but yours. This is not my life to live, but mine, but mine to live for your glory and your honor and your praise. When my kids learned to drive, Julie and I were teaching them. And I was doing a lot of sitting in the front seat. And Julie was sitting in the back seat a lot. Uh, so maybe I was teaching the drive. I'm not sure how that works. Um, but anyway, I think we both were doing it. Julie was praying, I guess. Um, and as we're going to teach the kids to drive, and they did fine, and they did great, and they're good drivers and all that stuff. Uh, but I learned to use, um, with, I don't know, an imaginary brake. <laughs> and any parent who's ever learned to t teach your child to drive, you use an imaginary brake. I love the little handles, too, on the side, on the passenger side. Hold on to that and hit the brake. And, uh, and every time I would grab that, he'd go, you, what's wrong? And I'm like, just hit the brake, bro. Um, but why would I respond that way? Because I want to be in control. And the reason the Jews responded the way they did is because they wanted to be in control. And the reason many people reject Jesus and think they're fine with simply knowing about him, but not knowing him personally, not placing faith in God's Son for their salvation, their forgiveness, they still place faith in their works and what they can do, and they don't place faith in Jesus because they want to be in control. And to be in control in your life and to say that you're the master of your life rather than Jesus is Lord of your life is to miss heaven. Check out what Jesus says in the next few verses. In verses 33 down through verse 36, he says this. Then Jesus said, I am only with you for a short time. Then I go to be with the one who sent me. He keeps saying, I'm going to go back to the Father. I'm going somewhere. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Well, what, what? And then he goes, then the Jews said to one another, where does he intend to go that we won't find him? They're just still confused. He doesn't intend to go to the Jewish people dispersed among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, does he? He's thinking he's going to go somewhere else and, and go hang out with the Jews uh, dispersed among the Greeks and start teaching them. He, and that's not what he was doing. And then in verse 36 says, what is this remark he made? You will look for me and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. He told these Jews he's about to leave. And they're trying to imprison him and they're trying to kill him. Where was Jesus going that they could not go? Heaven. To be with the one who sent him, the Father. That's where Jesus was going. After he died, he spent some time with the disciples and then he eventually ascended to be with the Father. And he was with the Father. He is with the Father now. And the only ones who can go and be where he is are those who place faith in God's Son, in Jesus, for salvation. Those placing faith in their works or their own control or their own whatever, they cannot, they cannot go where Jesus is. 
And if you reject God's son, even if you do it nicely, even if you do it by saying, I don't believe anything, to reject God's son in any level when it comes to salvation, guess what? You never see heaven. Where I am, you cannot come. All this construction on Highway 60, the road was cut off. Many of you know who commute into town for part of the week. We thought it was going to be through the weekend, but they got it done, I think, a day or two early, and, and I'm grateful for that. But I had to go into Springfield one day this week, and I was going in, and, and I needed to go to a certain place in town. And as I was going in, automatically the roads went from two lanes to being coned off, and we were diverted off onto another highway. There, there were no other options. There was just a road you thought you could go as you wanted, but you were diverted. There was just one way. Jesus meant what he said in John 14, 6. That he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. The only way to heaven is to place your faith in Jesus Christ. To repent of your sin and trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Master of your life. That is essential. Now, I know there's many in your room going, Pastor, I've already done that. I've already placed my faith. But you know what you have? You've got friends who've not done that. You've got co-workers who haven't done that. You have neighbors, you have family members, you have friends who've never placed their faith in Jesus. And the reality for them is they will never see heaven unless they place their faith in God's Son, Jesus Christ. Third consequence. First consequence is never knowing God. Second consequence is never seeing heaven. Third consequence is never being satisfied. I love how Jesus ends this chapter in this way he talks about the promise of the holy spirit but i love the words the imagery jesus uses he uses imagery he used also in john chapter 4 talking about living water and here's what jesus said verse 37 on the last and most important day of the festival jesus stood up and cried out if anyone is thirsty let him come to me and drink the one who believes in me the scripture has said will have streams of living water flowing from deep within him he said this about the Spirit, whose, those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So something interesting, as we began last week, we talked about that there's a certain feast that was happening. The Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Shelters, Feast of Booths, it's several different names, all talks about the time where the nation of Israel lived in the wilderness and lived in tents. And they would go from location to location. They lived in tents. And, and the presence of God was in a tabernacle, which was basically a temple that was a, a tent. And God's presence abided in the center of his people when they encamped. Part of the celebration of tabernacles involves the pouring out of water. And on this last day when they're doing this symbolism of pouring out water, Jesus says, He's a living water. And if you believe in him, you'll never thirst. No amount of water provided can compare to Jesus. God provided water for the nation of Israel in their wilderness. He provided it from rocks. But Jesus is greater than that. That he is living water that satisfies to the very core and soul of who we are. That he is that thing that we thirst for. He is the thing that we long for. He is what our heart desires more than anything. Our heart, we will fill it up with so much stuff and so many things. But he is what we really need and we really are craving. And we only one who can truly satisfy. Look at verse 37. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. You ever been thirsty before? I was painting our back porch uh, deck on our back of our house, and I was working on that the first part one evening, the first part of this week, trying to finish it up and, and get it where it needed to be. And I'm I'm painting and furiously trying to get everything where it needs to be. And 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 I'm just when I get in a working mode, I don't stop. Don't stop for water. Don't stop for anything. And I'm just I, I, I finished prepping and I'm painting and I'm hustling. And when I got through, I'm like I needed like three bottles of water. I drink one, and that's not enough, and I drink another one, and that's not enough, and I drink the third one, and I had to go to the bathroom, but that's another subject and a different time. 
But, but I, mean, I, I was just, I couldn't get my thirst quenched. And Jesus said, for those who follow him, they'll never thirst again, spiritually. They'll never seek that next thing to fill that void in their life. Because Christ will be filling that. His spirit will be abiding in them. And that will be enough. That they will be fully satisfied. That those who reject Jesus are never satisfied. And he actually goes on a little further and says that the one who believes in me, as the scripture, talking about a passage from Zechariah, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flowing from deep within him. Jesus says that the person who believes in him will have the Holy Spirit abiding with him. John goes on to tell us that. Uh, the Holy Spirit abiding within them. And guess what? They not only will be satisfied, but they will be changed to a point that they will be exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. And they will be overflowing in every aspect of their life. Those who place faith in Jesus Christ, they overflow uh, with his mercy and his goodness. And they want to share him. And they want to tell others about him. And they want to live for him. And their life is radically changed. I was a young pastor. I wanted to describe this idea one time. And I thought, you know, it would be really good to do that Mentos trick. You know the Mentos trick where you take a Diet Coke and you drop some Mentos in it and it goes everywhere? It's really not good to do on the platform, just so you all know. It's more for a science trick you do at home, and it's great. But, but when I, I was dropping those Mentos in that drink one time, that, that thing, I, and I limited the number I did, but that thing just went, it just kind of went everywhere. It just overflowed. When Christ is in you, and he's changing you and transforming it, it is evident on the outside. It overflows. People can see your changed life. It is Full demonstration for the world. I love what Paul said in Romans 15, 13. He says, Now may the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you, dear friend, are you overflowing? Is, is it evident in the way you live and how you conduct your business and how you live in the context of your marriage and how you lead your children and, and love them? Is it evident in your life that you've been changed by Jesus. Because if you reject Jesus, you'll never be satisfied. There'll be no overflow. The overflow won't be good. And, and then after Jesus says this, the people begin to continue to debate. They continue to have questions. All that Jesus said, all these consequences of not following him, not to reject him, and they just have more questions. When some from the crowd, verse 40 says, heard these words, they said, this truly is the prophet. Others said, this is the Messiah. But some said, surely the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Doesn't the scripture say the Messiah comes from David's offspring, from the town of Bethlehem where David lived? They didn't know, did they? Sorry, that's just an aside. Um, verse 43, so the crowd was divided because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the servants came to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked him, Why didn't you bring him? The servants answered, No man ever spoke like this. The Pharisees responded to them, Are you, too fool? Are you fooled too? Have any of the rulers or Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd which doesn't know the law is accursed. See, they're, they're judging. They're just knowing the facts but not knowing the person. In, in verse 50, Nicodemus. Remember John 3, Nicodemus, that Jesus talked to earlier the one who came to him previously and who was one who was one of them said to them our law doesn't judge a man before it hears for, from him and knows what he does he is doing does it you aren't from Galilee too are you they replied investigate and you will see no prophet arises from Galilee there was tension after Jesus had shared all that he did there were still people who believed and people who didn't believe. After all Jesus taught, after all that he said, after all these consequences about, about not knowing God and not going to heaven and, and not being satisfied, after all this stuff, and, and still there's people rejecting Jesus, and they would live life never being satisfied no matter what they heard. There's a real consequences to not following Jesus. 
If you reject Jesus, you will not know God. You'll know about him, but you won't know him. If you reject Jesus, you will not see heaven. You'll know a lot about it, but you won't see it one day because you've not believed in God's Son. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you're here today and you've not believed in Jesus, you'll spend all of your life never being satisfied. Just like these folks, arguing. After having heard that they're offered living water, if they just believe in Jesus, if they'll just come to Him and surrender their life to Him, if they'll just do that, but they still were in tension over it. So this message hits us in two ways. Number one, if you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, do not leave today. Do not leave this moment. The consequences are not something you can avoid. They're not something you can dodge. If you step out of this life, and we don't know why that is, and you don't know Jesus, you will never know God, you will never see heaven, and you will never, ever eternally be satisfied. But if you do place your faith in Him, you will know God, you will see heaven, and you will know what it's like to be spiritually satisfied for all of eternity. Now, how do we do that? Why, well, how is that made possible? Well, here's what God's Son did for us. He left heaven, and He came to earth, and we hear of stories about Jesus teaching and healing and all that stuff. We've talked about some of that even today. But why did He do it? The Scripture says that Jesus didn't get in prison because it wasn't His appointed time. What was Jesus' appointed time? He had a time in a day that he went to a Roman cross. And he laid down his life in your place. He quite literally took all of your sin upon him. And if you'll simply place your faith and trust in him, turn from your sin, place your trust in Jesus, turn from your self-reliance and place your faith in him, your trust in him, you will be saved. Scripture says that. Romans chapter 10, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, if you don't do anything today, do that. If you don't do anything today, come talk to us about that. Come talk to us about how to follow Jesus. The consequences are real. And they're eternal in their scope. But for many of us in this room, we've already placed faith in Jesus. And you're like, Pastor, I knew all that stuff. But you know what you have and I have? We've all got a friend. We've all got a family member. We've all got somebody in our life that doesn't know Jesus. And if they were to step out of eternity today, they would never know God. They would never see heaven. And they would never be satisfied in Christ. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about that name right now. When I talked about somebody, I talked about a name, a person, somebody's name came to mind. And here's what I want you to do during the invitation. I want you to come and forward with that person's name on your mind and just pray for them. Pray for that friend, that neighbor, that coworker. And I, and I mentioned that you're like, going, I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking about people. I, I'll be honest with you. Even now this morning, I'm thinking, who, who, who do I need to be praying for? And, and I'm, I was struggling. Been here a year. I've spent most of my time with Christians. And then God in clarity said, you need to pray for this person right here. So that's my one. Who's your one? Who's your person you could be praying for? Who's your person that doesn't know Christ, that, that's far from him, that's rejected him, that's going to face the consequences and begin to pray for that person? And during this time, let's begin a moment just praying for these folks. But not just today. Go home tomorrow and pray for them. Pray that God will give you open doors to share Christ with them. Open doors to invite them to some event we're having. Open doors. Just pray that God will work. Open doors to invest in them. Who do you know? Take a moment. Think about that person. And during this invitation, just, just come forward and, and let's pray for our friends, our coworkers, that will face real consequences if they don't. Accept his son. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today.